Hey everyone, this is Kyron Silva from Taurus Comics and the Four Tales Podcast, and I am honored to bring to you a podcast for all intents and purposes. You're listening to The 14th Source for all geeky and nerdy news and discussion, which means that you're listening to a podcast. For all intents and purposes. I'm Dee Bethel. And I'm Andrew Asplund. And we are your two overeducated, codependent nerd hosts, bringing you the things that we like to talk about, but filtered through inquisitive and critical lenses. In the episode for Friday, February 3rd, 2023. And yeah, there was a... A strange new opening to the episode. Apparently, we have a sponsorship. We willed a sponsorship into existence, Andrew. So let's just extend our thanks and support uh, to Kyron Silva of Taurus Comics yeah, for a, sponsoring our show. Yeah, yeah. He's he's the yeah the hero uh, we we needed or the hero we deserved. I'm not sure. The patron saint of our show, really. Let's be honest. And we should be clear, uh, dear listeners, Kyron's giving us a lot of money. So much money. It's crazy. So be sure to support Taurus Comics at TaurusComics.com. 100% of our revenue comes from Kyron. <laughs> right, which, let me do the math here real quick. Carry the ones. Zero dollars. Yeah, all zero. Uh, I think we might be bad at business, Andrew. We have been for almost a decade. Indeed. And we'll do it for a decade more. But speaking of bad business or perhaps good business, things have actually moved forward with this whole open game license fiasco. Yes. Yes, you are correct. Dan. Let's bring this to a close, Andrew. What? Yeah, not a close. So on Friday, Hasbro announced they are laying off 15% of their employees <laughs> and... And what are you what are you laughing at? Is that not what you were talking about? <laughs> nope, that's perfect. That's uh, exactly what I was talking. Um, is that, Hasbro, I, owners of Wizards of, of the Coast, owners of Wizards of the Coast, announced they're getting rid of fifteen percent of their staff. Yeah, uh, because they're they're victory uh, to the gamers, Andrew. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm assuming that's an unrelated news bite. I'm sorry. No, what, what you're actually talking about on Friday. Uh, so what was that, J- January 26th, uh, 25th? I don't remember. 7th, actually. 7th. It was the Friday, yeah. Uh, what The real thing was that, you know, after uh, a, a pretty wild and, <laughs> and crazy month and a, ch- and a half, yeah. a month and change, whatever, uh, including some wild weeks where perhaps uh, all the wrong choices were made repeatedly, <laughs> uh, yeah. Wizards of the Coast has announced uh, that as of right now, uh, they are not going to make any changes to the open game license that they're going to it's it's going to stay as it is. And that okay. the the Dungeons and Dragons 5.1 or the I'm sorry, the system reference document 5.1, which is kind of like <laughs> the 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 basic iteration of the fifth edition D&D rule set will be released under the Creative Commons 4.0 attribution license. Oh shit, are we ending the episode? Right. Hold on. <laughs> it's like I feel like I've said this before. Did Kevin <laughs> McLeod write the SRD? Uh, it's got some groovy tunes. So what they're doing is they're saying, you know, here's this this representation of the D&D rules that we are throwing into uh, uh, basically, a status where you can use it. It's it's right. and, you know, but the way of Creative Commons is it's it's kind of stuck now, right? Mm-hmm. Like they can't you could it always exists in that kind of milieu. Uh, you can do stuff with it, and you can and do stuff. All you have to do is is do an attribution, which they actually specify what the attribution is. You just have to say something, something, something. Wizards of the Coast is my god. Um, <laughs> right. So it's it's unusual because this is this is a stark change to everything they've been doing in the last month and a half, you know, where they were trying to change it, trying to include royalties, trying to do whatever, then saying no, this is not what we meant. Uh, mm-hmm. So right now they're they are it's essentially they've capitulated. Uh, although you know, undoubtedly we all won, right? That's what they that's what they say. You won, I won. You know, you can't like 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 you said in. In the uh, classic film Thor Ragnarok, you know, you can't have a revolution without someone to overthrow. So really, we're all the winners here. (laughs) Um, You know, so it's I think it's interesting to me because, 
you know, it, right now, it, it, so everyone's, everyone's kind of moving forward. Uh, now, how does this affect the industry? I, I think it is not an industry unscathed. Uh, I believe, you know, like, for example, you know, Paizo announced they're doing a new license, um, working with a lot of, collaborating with a lot of peers. I right. think that's going to be their Orc the license, yeah. right? Yeah. I think that's they're still gonna, moving forward with that? Yeah, they, I think, because I think they realize that they just, that, that really a new license is needed. Uh, for these people to do what they want to do. Um, Honestly, they, yeah, yeah. It sounds like Hasbro's announcement just reset the doomsday clock a little bit. That's really, that's what I think there's a lot of perceptions that, you know what, if you were relying on fifth edition products, you don't have to crap your pants right now. You now have time to transition. Uh, and sure. I've seen people say it like, look, I'm not going to stop making fifth edition products now, but I'm going to start doing something else because I know, like, there's a trust that has been broken for this th the third party community. Um, I think, you know, people that some people are just willing to go with it. Right. Uh, although they you know had, they had some statistics because they did a survey. The basic suggestion is the vast majority of people were not keen on this. Right. People said that they didn't like the new one. People said that they this would fundamentally change their business practice. Some people said that they wouldn't produce. They refused to comport with a new license if one was issued with the, you know, kind of the rules that were provided. So, um, yeah, I think just a lot of people are just not. It's like, OK, you back down. Yeah, but we know you'll like the, you'll do this again. Is I think the what I see a lot of people kind of saying. Um, so you know, it's it is it's it's a cool like you know the world's not the sky's not falling, um, <laughs> but it it could be. This is the first time I, I think it's mostly like in the in the um, the commentary about it where people are really talking about the Creative Commons license here. Is that new to this whole thing and how much does that actually kind of rein in Watsi's power trip here like how much how many hoops are they gonna have to jump through to actually do the next open game license to actually exert more control the control that they wanted to exert with this up uh, with this this new version of the there's not license. I don't have a good answer for you uh, okay this okay. is actually this is a this is so a lot of attorneys discuss this, and some of them are good attorneys. Like some of them are legitimate, like legitimate, knowledgeable attorneys can discuss this rationally and fundamentally disagree on everything. Sure, because a lot of this is basically like unsettled law, where it's or or just it's not even unsettled, like unexplored law. Right, we don't really know how this is going to look. I mean, I said some commentary on it. Some other people have had some commentary Should on it. Should we discuss what Creative Commons means in the first hmm. place? Yeah, Creative Commons, if you don't know, it's a it's a license that was, that's was that been created over the past, uh, or a series of licenses that were instanced over the last basically 20 years or so yeah. that are saying, hey, this is for people that want to do, you know, they want to license, they want to create things and they want to put them out not quite into the public domain because the public domain always has the problem of it's you, you're letting it free like it's it now lives in 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 the anyone can do anything wherever with it but you you may say you know I want to I want to put this out there but I want certain things to remain so like we use Kevin McLeod's uh, music it's under the Creative Commons by by attribution which right. means that we can use it in whatever context we want but we have to always attribute it to him. We have to say, yo, this dude made this music. That's right. actually a pretty Especially common one. because like he's leading with that as well. He's like, hey, I'm making my music for this license. In right. A lot of ways. So that's yeah. do you see that? Um there's others that are that are uh by attribution or there's what non there's non commercial uh versions. So like, hey, I'm putting this out in the Creative Commons. You can do it just not for commercial purposes. Mm. And so the idea is saying like, hey, if you comport with what I'm with that res restriction, you can do what you want with it. But if you don't, then you are invalidating the license, and this returns to a copyright, you know, right or whatever. Right. Generally, a copyright issue. So it'd be like, oh, in that case, I can now sue you for infringing on my copyright. Um, that's kind of the idea. And there's also was it share and share alike versions where you say hey, you can do this, but you also have to release what you do under a similar share alike license. Um, so there's. It, it is. It's a way. It's to 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 get people to be more comfortable sharing things, to be able to put stuff out there that people can use, rather than everyone like trying to closely guard their copyrighted content like a like a Mickey Mouse, right? Giving them a way to share things and have right. it be legally viable without throwing it like without going all the way into I release all control over this fundamentally, right? Right. So to put 
basically the open game license into this field complicates things a little bit, it sounds like. Well, the open game license is, uh, it was descended from, you know, some of the, 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 the licenses from programmers, like the, the GNU uh, general public license, the GPL, and a few others. There's now, like, so in programming, there's a bunch of licenses, too, that are about, like, hey, I'm going to put my code out there. You can use it under, okay. you know, certain restrictions. Um the, and the, the problem and where this all gets where runs awry, as we've discussed, is that there are multiple things in play. There's there's copyright, there's patent, there's ostensibly trademark, but that's not really because trademark is not, a, you know, that one's usually more, in, you know, like you, people guard that more carefully. Right, um, more enforced, yeah. But really, that's so that's why it's, it's a weird thing because, and then the rules for these things are all different, right? Software has different, it interacts differently than a story does. It interacts differently than art you know, um, and that's why that's why it's always a bit tough um, and why I always say that, like, one of the arguments that that a, a few attorneys have always made was that the, even the open game license at its core was built on on some ideas that, you know, like I always say it was built on a misunderstanding of software. Um, you know, the idea that like we because they, they say we, we look to software as a guide. It's like, well, OK, but realizing that software itself especially at that time, was in the midst of patent crazy, right? Like we had, that's the whole concept of patent trolls grew out of the dot-com era of people patenting stupid software shit and then selling those patents to, you know, to or, or having their patents passed to, to, to the patent trolls um, who then went around suing people for nonsense. It's, it's a, it is this issue of um, there's kind of different ways it works, you know. The same thing with, like, software. Like, software sort of can be copyrighted, but then also, mm-hmm. like, there's a lot of, like, well, actually, but what you copyrighted was just this specific, you know, block of code. If someone wrote it themselves with the same algorithm, then they're fine. Stuff like that. It's, it's a challenge. So I think the big thing is they've um, – the reason why the Creative Commons, uh, I think, is a choice. It's one that other people have done. Um, for in fact, as an example, uh, the the uh, role playing game Fate Core and mm-hmm. Fate Accelerated and Fate Condensed are all released under a Creative Commons uh, by attribution license, um, and 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 they came from the perspective of they'd spoken to some attorneys who said, well, yeah, really, you, nothing you have here is actually copyrightable, or at least it's not. The only thing you can copyright is just your specific telling of your rules. But you know, okay. so their perspective was like, well, let's just make it then available because that way you feel you feel safe knowing you can use our exact version and not worry about the the fuss. So what's the difference between that and D and D? Well, and that's and as, as we always go on, it's it's it, it's it base it's all you know what your interpretation of what is protectable, what is not, um, and I think the idea that it's more that, like. It, it depends on lawyers' interpretation of right, and, what's and really, it's, it, 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 it would what would boil it down to is is the lawyers going to court, you know, whatever the the, the judge that decides the case, the appellate court that decides it, you know, it, it is a it is a challenge, and as I've the one thing I've always I've tried to reiterate now that I've I've learned more about this in the last decade is that being told I'm not going to co sue you is the most important thing that any of this stuff does. Sure. Right. Yeah. Being able to say that really like the the open game license, it's the most important thing it did was it was Wizards of the Coast saying, I'm not going to sue you. So the idea that they were monkeying with it, they were like putting like they wanted to change it. They wanted to make it so they could sue you by saying you violated the license because you did something they didn't like. That kind of stuff was like that's what made the whole discussion scary. Right. Oh, we wanted to enforce certain standards. It's like, well, what are those standards? Right. Mm -hmm. You know, Wizards of the Coast historically has has blocked gay LGBT content on the DMs Guild. So is that what it is? If I make a gay D&D adventure, are you going to come and deny my license and then sue me? Specifically, if you try to like market and profit off or of the gay D and D, yeah, I guess. I mean, if I'm yeah, using I'll their beca- if if they think I, you know, so it's so it's a tough conversation, um, and that's why I think everything about this is so. I should say, like, what if you want to like license and sell a gay D and D mechanic? Like, that's you should be able to. <laughs> that's well, not like, but yeah. I mean, you have to realize that where that the one of the whole things about the open game license, the first time it really got called into question was when someone released a book of like of D D sexy stuff. Literally mm. had like a page of dildos in the equipment section. And and the idea was, oh, that's not what we wanted. We don't want people to make D sexy. 
they wanted to try to actually revoke that play. And actually, that's that, there's some history there about the the D twenty trademark license. Oh uh, sure, which is really where that ended. It's complicated. Said, yeah, we don't we don't want you guys to to be affiliated with us because we don't like sex, um, sexy sex. So it's it's tough. It is a challenge, and, and and that's why I think this whole thing is so complicated. Now that right. being said, I think it is worth acknowledging that in this whole hot mess. Um, I'm clearly no uh, fan of Watsi. I actually think that they are being a, a bad player generally. However, this whole thing has also been a hot mess because a lot of people have been using, you know, this has been a fuel for clickbait. It's been a fuel mm -hmm. for like ranty videos, you know, um, people saying, oh, Watsi's the, the villain of the story. They're going to go burn. I mean, yeah, here we are talking about it for the third time. And if, if we monetized anything, we'd make like a buck by now. Um, At least half a buck. At least half a buck. So I, it is. There is an interesting thing where I think um, there's a lot of people that were, you know, kind of using this as a fuel for their rage engine um, to sell tickets. Basically, it's clear that there are people that work for Watsi that are not supportive of Watsi's actions in a lot of ways. Like yeah. again, Watsi as a as a company is not making good decisions. That does not demonize the people necessarily that work for them. Yeah. Um, and. Like you said, there are plenty of people that are just sort of vultures on on this on this issue as well. That are just trying to capitalize on it as much as possible. You know, that's in in a lot of ways. I don't want to say as despicable, but it is despicable as well. And that's just like the, the like the modern that's news the world ecosystem, yeah. right? Yeah, and it sucks. And um, I guess the question I have for you is that, and of course, you don't have any insider information. I guess we should also say again, we know people that work for Wizards of the Coast, but like, it's just you speculating, if you don't mind speculating. How likely is it for Wizards to come back a year or, m or more from now going like, okay, no, we figured it out. Oh, uh, I, I, I actually, there's no doubt that when they finally decide to do their new D&D, &D, one D&D, &D, it is going to have a different they're not going to use the OGL. They're not going to use like what they've done is they took what exists and they put it out there saying, go do your thing. We're not going to, but I, I, I would be shocked if the new D and D was under the existing OGL. Right. I just don't It'd be under it. like D and D beyond or whatever they're, or whatever they're, I, yeah. they'll find some new way to say it. And I mean, I, to me, it's, it, there's, it, there's no doubt in my mind that they, this is, this is the, 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 the cow, they, the cash cow they want to hunt. And I, like, they, they want to find a way to, to close, to wall their garden more. Yeah. Uh, oh, which, sure. Which they already, like, they already have ways to do it. They have a thing called the DMs Guild, which lets you create mm -hmm. D&D products mm -hmm. that even uses their copyrighted, actually copyrighted material, like their settings, their characters, their art. Um, and except, of course, that one, they take 50% of what you sell. Or th that's more like the uh, kind of like a like in video game terms, kind of like a like a mod shop or a kind right. Of thing. It's the thing of it is is like they they they're going to try to, to 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 I think you know if you imagine like Skyrim right like they want to yes, they want to shut that's down exactly the, what I was thinking about the actually, open yeah. Skyrim mods and they want to only you only get the Skyrim mods through their, Improved, their D &D yeah. store their Wizards of the Coast store. That's I <laughs> right. there's no doubt in my mind because I mean when you look at the executives of Watsi. I think we talked about this. A lot of them come from uh, video game, MMO, and whatever backgrounds. Like and have at least sp been speaking openly about how they want to move towards, like, or how they're being inspired by the sort of video game marketplace, mm -hmm. which is very questionable considering tabletop games are, are, I mean, I would say distinctly not video games. Yeah, I, I think so. Um, I think so, right? The, but the one thing I think the, the the some of my takeaways about this, the, I think my biggest one that really, I think this was a good thing overall. I think that it got a lot. It one of the issues that people always talk about in the role playing game community is that people are like stuck on D and D, right? They're like, oh, but D and D, but D and D. You know, they don't want to try new stuff. You know, they don't want. Right, right. I, I love my one the one comment I saw was all those people who used to say that. You know, oh, I, you know, who are now trying new games who used to say, oh, I don't want to learn a, a new rule set. It's like, well, you never learned the first one, so just go play <laughs> a new game. Um, Damn. But I think there's, I mean, and the, the thing is, I, I, if you look at the what happened with people canceling their subscriptions to D&D &D Beyond, I imagine that Wizards of the Coast saw little to no real affect their revenue. Um like maybe it was, you know, it was a blip. It was enough to notice, but like I suspect the long term is they're going to be like, oh, this is a bump, right? But contrast it with all these game companies like Chaosium, Paizo, Monty Cook Games, who are basically saying we are sold out. 
right? We Paizo had to put a thing on their website. I think Chaosium, who does Call of Cthulhu and other games, they basically said like we sold like uh, six months or eight months of supply in two weeks. Jeez. You know, just the idea that like what was a marginal affect to Wizards of the Coast was like a, a was like a huge day for these other companies um, because again, it's the order of magnitude. You know, no matter what anyone thinks. Wizards of the Coast is the only player in its room. Everyone else is playing with each other and trying to fight against the giant, right? Right. And and that's not, from what I understand, that's not stopping with this acquiescence, right? It's like, oh no, Chaosium and Paizo yeah. are moving forward with their safety measures, honestly. Yeah. Because, because, yeah, this is a victory, but it's not, it's not protection. Yeah, and I, you know, and there's that perception that um, that they've made it clear that they that whether or not they're doing it now, they they have that in their back pocket that we can right. unwind all the stuff that we've done. So I think a lot of people are just like, well, then we're going to be we're going to break off from you as much as we can. And I mean, the biggest one for me, yeah, I, I play Pathfinder a lot. I like Paizo. I like the games they make. I th- I think overall they're not as shitty a company as Wizards of the Coast. Um, uh, but then I actually think of Kobold Press, uh, who, you know, they announced they're going to do their new game, Black Flag. And they've even said, we're not stopping. Like, we're going to keep doing that. And they've really, they're they're having their own Pathfinder moment where they're like, this is now, we're going to make our own game system. Was Black Flag originally like a co-development with WotC or? No, it's when, when WotC started this whole thing okay. three weeks ago, they said, you know what? Black Flag is the new game we're making based on kind of our derivations of what we've been doing for uh, D&D 5th edition. So that's cool. You would expect WotC to kind of make its next big statement when it releases the next edition of D&D? Uh, who knows, right? How, I mean, how, how far off do you think they are from that? I don't think they have a... Uh, they probably have an internal time frame, but I don't think... Okay. If anything, I think t- people assume 2024 because okay. that is the... 60th, 50th anniversary. Uh, is it 50th anniversary? What's no 1974? Idea. Math is important. That's 50 years ago. Yeah. So it's going to be the 50th anniversary of D&D. So the general consensus is that in 2024, they're going to release one D&D, whatever that is. Gotcha. Yeah. Um, and it's going to be, you know. <laughs> Following the Xbox model there. Right. Um, I mean, the important thing is this, Andrew, that with all this now kind of behind us, we can't forget to mention that uh, D&D, Honor Amongst Thieves, coming only to theaters March 31st. So be sure to get your tickets now. But yeah, so that's that's the situation there. I don't think there's I don't think we're going to hear anything about it for a while. I, I right. But I, I think the industry is better because of it, because we're going to see yes. new, you know, people making new stuff. A lot of people playing games that previously weren't interested in playing, you know, that didn't want to. I mean, I still see. See, although I, my 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 target demos is is very niche, I see still people saying, like, "Hey, we're wrapping up our five E game and we're going to switch to fill in the blank." Um, yes, that's that's the thing I'm thinking about. Like here, I, I hope they use this interim between now and whenever D and D does its next thing. It's like I I really hope the industry finds a way to elevate the the alternatives and of course the 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 other games that are out there because Mm -hmm. i mean you've known this forever like there's infinity amount of tabletop games out there that are just as viable just as interesting and doing new interesting things that are perhaps in a lot of ways more inclusive more engaging than what the traditional and i guess modern DD sort of rule set does and if they can get if we can get more of a spotlight on those systems and those games uh, it's it's only for the better, so that we can elevate yeah. the the market overall, but also like in the long run, pull attention away from from Wizards of the Coast and, mm-hmm. and Dungeons and Dragons. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And at some point, there'll be a I'll I'll, I'll probably want to do a I'll talk about some sort of like how this is, you know, how this compares to the previous times in the in the history of D anD D. But I need to read more about the history of D anD D before I can do that. Aside from Paizo and their work, who would be another? recommendation from you to like get people into away from D and into like uh you know just playing cool. I, think it, I think it totally depends on what you 
what you you know you want out of your game. I mean, the biggest thing is right. also the idea that people are using D and D in a lot of ways that like probably you shouldn't be playing D and D. So I think, but I think there's you know, I think some people are finding you know Monty Cook's game, uh, the Cipher System, which I'm not a big fan of, but I know it's out there. Uh, Green Ronin Publishing or Green Ronin Games, yep. they have you've um, talked about them a couple times on the age, show. Yeah. Fantasy Age, Modern Age, uh, the the Expanse role playing game, the Dragon Age role playing game. Um, mm-hmm. And then you'd see, you've got, uh, of course, Paizo, um, and then who else I've seen? Uh, uh, yeah, there's just, a, and then of course, Modifius does a lot of these licensed games like Star Trek Adventures, Fallout, Dune, which um, I've, 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 I've really enjoyed the Star Trek Adventures role-playing game. I think these other ones have a lot of promise. Is Modifius doing the Doctor Who? No, that's Cubicle 7. Mm. Uh, Cubicle Uh-oh. 7. No, 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 they're like, man, don't... <laughs> Uh, they're doing war. So Cubicle Seven has the, I think they have the One Ring game, okay. um, second edition, I think it is, and then the Warhammer uh, Fantasy role playing fourth edition. Oh, uh, and they have the Doctor Who role playing game, which is man, there. It's the guy who owns like all these books, and I just yeah. every time I play the game, I'm reminded okay. of I think it's an awful game. <laughs> so wait, who has who has the MMPR game? Mighty Morphin Power, uh, that's uh, Renegade Game Studios. But they're Who also has a Transformers game. They have Transformers and, and G.I. Joe. Joe. They're, they're basically like uh, a big licensor or licensee of Wizards of the Coast. Um, Ooh, okay. Right, they're, I mean, when you think so, about it, right, think about the games tread, they're making. Tread lightly. They're all Hasbro, right? Right, right, right. So right. Oh, sure, yeah. <laughs> right, it's, yeah, it's just yeah. a, it's a whole, you know, it's they're not owned by Hasbro, but they might as well be. They actually do, Renegade does other games, they just... Oh, they also have these big Hasbro licenses, which is why it's weird that they're not. They don't use D and D, although it's it's a they're it's it's a clear derivative, um, and uh, in a in a not a very well designed. One. And we're coming out with the hot takes. I mean, based on the t- based on the two I've seen, Power Rangers and GI Joe, I can't recommend the games to anybody. Let me tell you what they get it right with the Transformers game. They could be. I have no uh- idea. So, if you, dear listeners, have any thoughts about the topics we discussed in this episode. Feel free to leave your thoughts and comments on the page for this episode at forallintents.net. You can also post your comments or engage in conversations with other listeners on our Facebook page. You can also find us on other social media where Andrew and I respectively uh, participate. You can find me on Instagram at dbethelcomics, and you can find Andrew on Mastodon at profound.dice.camp. Profounddark at dice.camp. Uh, I forgot the dark. Yeah, what I really love actually is is that in the last couple of weeks I've gotten a lot new tw- a lot more Twitter followers. Um, which I don't use Twitter anymore, so it's like, why are people following me? And I, I, I I'm, I'm actually going to assume it's because of our good friend Kyron Silva, director of Taurus Comics, people. sponsor the show. I mean, right? Like it's like people are like, yeah, let me follow this guy who doesn't tweet anymore. <laughs> Woo. <laughs> Uh, also, while you're at our website at forallintents.net, you can also take a look at our YouTube page, which you can get to by clicking on the link in the corner that says YouTube. There, you can also subscribe to the channel. You can uh, listen to the show. Uh, we we rebroadcast the show every week on the YouTubes as well. And occasionally get copyright uh, notifications. We're rebels. Thanks, dire straits. But you know what you should do? If you want it, you can like and subscribe. Yeah, you should definitely... Ring that bell. We use two tracks of music for our show. One is called Disc and Medusi. The other is called District 4. And they're both written and performed by Kevin McLeod of the Clan McLeod. Immortal swordsman, graph paper enthusiast, and musician extraordinaire. You can find his music at incompetech.filmmusic.io. And that's all licensed under the Creative Commons 4.0 attribution license. Ah, play the Kevin McLeod RPG. <laughs> if you'd like the show and like to help us out, the best way to do so would be to subscribe to the show using whichever podcasting service you happen to use. Uh, what would help us out even more, though, would be to leave some sort of review, whether a text review or using their proprietary metric will spread the word to new potential listeners through the magic of algorithms. Algorithms. We can't go in depth because you are not um, in it. Because <laughs> we're in it for the clicks. We're in here for the page for the page views, right, Andrew? Um, yeah, yeah. The Last of Us mm. is apparently is making people happy and other people upset because they decided to make what's it called good television. <laughs> yeah, apparently there's there's some people who are upset and those people are 
They wear Assholes. red hats. <laughs> they wear red hats. <laughs> for me, for those that don't know, the, the third episode of season one of The Last of Us aired this last weekend. And it's kind of a, a self-contained episode about two characters that are not the main characters. Mm-hmm. Showing life in a world of... In, in a post-apocalyptic world that probes a lot of tropes and 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 taboos, I guess, in some way, shape, or form, depending on who you are. Basically, it depicts a loving, devoted, gay relationship in a prepper world that apparently pissed a lot of people off, but also shined a light on a loving gay relationship, which, especially in... in, in like, I don't, I don't even want to say prime time because we live in a streaming world, but like right. in a major studio television show, we rarely get like an uncompromising view at that kind of relationship. My wife and I are watching the show. We were ugly crying through the whole episode. <laughs> there's, an, there's an added level, I would say, for me as a person that has played the games. I don't know the games super well. I love the games. I've only played the, each the first and the second one once because they're really dark games and they make me feel bad. <laughs> Being reminded of how kind of the the storyline of these characters in the show played out in the games. It's another example, and I think I talked about this when I when I talked about the first episode. It's like I again it's just doing what a good adaptation does. It's not just let's bring the video game to the show to show what those non-gamers are missing, right? It's right. actually making choices to make a good TV show. And before I go too far off on that, like, it does a couple things. It, 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 it shows me that they know what they're doing, but more importantly for nerds like us, the creators of the show are, are two people. One is like a TV person, the guy that did Chernobyl, and the other creator of the show is one of the co-creators and writers of the game. <laughs> the guy who did Chernobyl, another uplifting show. <laughs> right, yeah. But even he comes, I think he comes from like, I don't remember his name, but he comes from a lineage that is not as, as, as venerated as Chernobyl is. Like, I think his early work is like doing like parody movies, like scary movie adjacent kind of stuff. He's like, here's the here's superhero movie where we make fun of all the superhero <laughs> movies lately. And then he's like, you know what? I have something to say and started making, you know, quality television. What it shows is that to me, yeah, we always talk about this video game or whatnot should be, could be a good movie or a good TV show. I think when we say that a lot of times we're just talking about literal like take one and put it in another sphere. This is a good example of, of them actually doing the work to make that happen. So that's different from the game, but it's a better TV show because of it. And I guess I'm saying that because in the game, you are playing as Joel, and you never leave his point of view. Right. In which case, what we see of the characters, Bill and Frank, I think his name is, in in the in the two characters that are focus of, of episode three of Last of Us is very different <clears throat> because as Joel, you're not a part of that relationship, <laughs> right? Right. And so they made decisions in the game so that you could go forward with the plot, get some good backstory, but keep moving forward. It's not about them. But here we have an opportunity to actually dive into that relationship and make different decisions that really elevate what life in this kind of world is like. And it's clear that they, I would say, it seems like generally the, the decisions they made were good. I think you and I, in a, in a lot of ways, come at this this from different angles. But what have you heard? As someone that has, and there is, there is a reason why I'm being kind of cagey, is that you have not seen the show. I have not seen it. No, 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 I have not. Um, because again, I'm, I'm behind. Uh, but I heard, you know, it's, 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 I will say that I did get a phone call on Monday saying, Hey, have you have you seen have you seen The Last of Us uh, from like a government agent, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like a uh, deep state government agent? That's clear. I'm, I'm masking masking the person's voice. Oh yeah, yeah, clearly. Yeah, uh, and and I said no, no, I haven't. Uh, oh, you should. It's uh, it's it's going to be talked about. And and it's funny because it didn't take long for me to start seeing it on my very limited, you know, social media talky talk of people saying like talking about. Whatever I'm like, why are people talking about Dick Offerman? You know, what's what's he done now? Um, <laughs> and so yeah, it's 
And so it is clear, I think, that, that it's something worth talking about. Um, and, I, you know, people are a lot of people are saying that they watched it. And it is, yeah, a lot of crying, a lot of whatever, but just a lot of like a, an impactful episode in a way that no one was expecting. Right. Right. No, I don't think anyone would have, you know, for everything that The Last of Us may, may be doing, this was not the like... Yeah, no one was prepared for this. You know, no one no one was saying, hey, let's watch a show about this character and a backstory that we never really saw. Right, right. Um, and and then to have, you know, some two very talented actors. I, I don't actually know, and I'm not sure what the other guy uh, has done, but Nick Offerman, right? You Nick know, Offerman. I always, makes interesting I'm, choices, yeah. Makes inter- I, what I always loved is because I know people who always like, they used his character from Parks and Rec as like, I used to know a guy that was in the Navy with who's like, yeah, I'm exactly like this guy. And it's like, in retrospect, like, actually, no, I mean, Nick Offerman is an actor. You know, he, he right. acts. Because um, he also, I, I was talking to someone where he's done other parts too, where it's like, he really, he acts. He, 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 he's, he plays different people. He does different things. Right. That's the thing. Like, he, he is a word worker. He is... He, he is a, a guy that I think he actually has ownership in some scotch company overseas and then like and like he he's a guy that's that that, that that advocates for having grit and like being true to yourself and like knowing what your role is but he's also like especially if knowing that role is making out with your husband <laughs> right but also like you should be compassionate for others because you know you have to live with them and right. If you don't, then you're an asshole, <laughs> kind of stuff. It's like he 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 treads this line between like libertarianism and like super lefty kind of stuff, and I think that would have been, that's what made him so good in the role of Ron Swanson from Parks and Rec. This like super libertarian because I think he holds a lot of those not values but opinions, but he's also not an asshole. <laughs> well, I think so, it's it it's it. Some of them are true and some of them are parody. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Um, but but then again, that he is he is you know uh, you know uh, like he's an actor uh, and he he, he acts because he does like every time I find out he's doing something, it's always like oh another right. thing I wasn't expecting. That's the thing that you like. It, yeah, he he is those things. He's a guy that works with his hands and fixes motors and stuff. But like, don't forget his chosen profession is to do pretend in front of people. <laughs> but I like when I like people talking about like oh fucking like heavy metal and hip hop, but like don't forget their job is to go up in front of people and sing songs. They're only tough so far, right? And so Nick Offerman, uh, what what I love about this as you as you're hinting at it is that he's showing his chops as as an actor and shows that sometimes we put a bit too much weight into the fiction that we're that we're seeing like god knows like both star trek is your religion and the mm-hmm. x-men is my persona right but like and and like i love patrick stewart and so far he seems to be every man every bit the man that jean luc picard is but like we also have to keep in mind he's an actor not a starship captain <laughs> right <laughs> right so yeah i so I, I'll, I'll watch it you know probably in the next couple of weeks uh you know, I, I, I'm kind of cooled off of super series shows right now, but I'll get back to it. Um, so you haven't you haven't dipped into Last of Us at all yet? No, I'm not. Uh, again, fair, and fair enough. Fair enough. Yeah, it's a dark show. Yeah, oh. well, especially because you're going off of last week. You just you made, you did a, a face deep dive into Walking Dead. Yeah, you need a break. Right. Well, it's like I and I got like three or four episodes into that, and that was another one where I'm like, all right, you know, I need to cool my jets on this. Where's the fun fun <laughs> shows? Right. Right. You know, where's the lighthearted romp? Uh, right. Why is everything so goddamn serious? That's a that's a question for the ages, my friend. So yeah. So I think. Um, but it, I, I I do. I, w- if nothing else, I really appreciate the the you know, they they took the time to do this this episode and to, and to feature some delightful actors doing uh, something that you don't see every day, um, but in a way that clearly compelled people to um, you know. To, to, to have emotions. So, yeah. Right. To actually, and have it be supported by a big budget show based on a big budget franchise. Like, it's a franchise for a big network. A network owned by a company that has not made the best decisions lately. Right. And actually having it generate, actual, I would argue, actual discourse. Like, let's have communication to accomplish some sort of goal. Like, in this case, it's a goal of understanding. Whether this is an episode that can change minds, I don't know. 
the future will tell that but but that it got enough eyes on it to actually create a conversation around it is fantastic so until you watch something uplifting and heartfelt dear listeners i'm d bethel and i'm Andrew Rasplund. and for all intents and purposes that was a podcast You know that on YouTube we got a copyright uh I know it was fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, what the fuck? And I had to go look. I'm like, oh I love what I loved was uh uh they're like, hey, we saw what you did for like 20 seconds. No big. No big. <laughs> no big. <laughs> it's weird, it's one of those shows where it's like it's hard to recommend because it is such a downer in a lot of ways. Right. Are you guys gonna t- talk about sad old gays uh, being I- being romantic, I, holding I, each other, eating strawberries. Uh, I, I don't know. We'll start. <laughs> Probably not. But Probably not. There's a meta quality to it, which is like the Nick Offerman angle, which is like he's like, I I, I carve boats with my bare hands and I fuck my wife. Mm-hmm. You know, like, but he's also super liberal. Um, right. Not that, not that liberal people don't fuck their wives. <laughs> but... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> No, not until I steal all your internal organs and make a little soup out of them. Oh, that's, well, that's not good yeah, that's at not all. Good at all. That's not good at all. like, ooh, this is concerning. <laughs> that's not... Wait. <laughs> what kind of spices are you talking about, though? Did you say contextualize or sexualize? Oh, a little bit of both. Hmm? Oh, consexualize.